Christians crumble because you put some stress into their life. You're just going, we got this in the bag. Look at, look at how many we just killed. Look at how many just accepted death. Look at how many that don't want to fight. It's like, don't you care about your kids? Don't you care about your parents? Don't you care about your friends? You know, get off your butt and fight for them. Hey, this is the Unrefined Podcast. I am Brandon Spain, your host, with co-host Lindsay Waters. Welcome to another episode. I believe that this episode is going to be pleasantly surprising to you. Lindsay and I had the opportunity to interview an amazing follower of Jesus who puts into action the commands of Christ. Not only is he an incredibly balanced minister of God, but he has seen some miraculous things in his journeys. Today we will discover how he walks with the Lord to be the hands and feet in a lost and lonely world. His stories are inspiring and create a sense of urgency for those of us in discipleship to step out and be Jesus in our part of the world. Today I would like you to join us as we dive into his stories and adventures and let's together learn a thing or two. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Steve Harmon. Welcome, Steve. I've got to say, I'm extremely happy to have you here with us. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me. If it's okay with you, let's start with where you started in ministry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, I started just in healing. I well, I mean, I was always about signs and wonders, wanting to see God do miracles, and uh, healing is pretty much where everybody starts. I I would say. Um, and 2008, I went on a missionary trip. Um, I believe that, uh, more healings happen when you're on a third world country on a missionary trip. Yep. You're right. <laughs> then, then, then when I would pray back at home, other people would dispute that and say, no, it's just as easy at home. Uh, I, I still don't believe that that's true, that it's just as easy at home because there is. Uh, there's just uh, different factors that go on, go on with it. And I think when it comes to healing, I've seen certain things that make it more possible and certain things that hinder it. So, Well, they have a West, they, they don't have a Western enlightenment worldview that we have, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Totally. And they don't have, uh, well, they don't have as much as we have. They, they have more desperation. They need, need, need healing. Not that we don't, but um, we have more options to us. They don't have insurance. They don't have uh, hospitals and all the medical, uh, uh, you know, the breakthroughs that we have had. So, I mean, there is more of a desperation. There's just a lot of other factors, I would say, um, that go along with it. But as far as... Um, their ability to really, uh, get, I mean, get healed is, to me, it's just so different, <laughs> you know. Uh, so when I went there, definitely saw some healing, and I was just blown away by the healings that I would see. And I was, it it changed me and made me even go further, you know, for that. And as I started going through the years, I started going on the streets more here and started to see ha- a pattern of how healing works and works better in different circumstances. Um, but then I would, you know, see people that weren't getting healed and I didn't understand why they weren't getting healed. Um, but I wanted to know, and I'm asking the Lord, okay, Lord, what, what's, what's the deal? Why aren't they all getting healed? And I think about a year later, um, I felt like the Lord gave me this word, and it was just, uh, uh, for lack of knowledge, people perish, mm. which I think kind of is a broad answer to the to the question, for lack of knowledge. And uh, then one day, I remember dealing with a person, and they were uh, manifesting, and it was the first time I've ever seen a person manifest a demon. Well, I wouldn't say it was the first time, but... They were manifesting, and uh, I started to jump on it and did the deliverance. And when I started working with that person, they, uh, I would say four of the five demons came out. 
not all of them, you know. And I remember posting that story and and somebody saying, "Hey, Steve, for that fifth one to get out, all you got to do is use your authority." And I'm like going, "Well, duh, <laughs> of course I know that." How did the first four come out? Because my authority. But the fifth one didn't come out with my authority. I don't know why. And that started me on the deliverance journey. So I started to learn about deliverance and uh, the ins and outs of why certain deliverances were, would work. And so um, over that time, that changed everything. It was like opening up a brand new door, a whole new world uh, about how things work in the spiritual world, uh, understanding more of the angelic and, and the legalities when it comes to how God works. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and so I saw people getting healed and getting breakthrough through that, uh, where I wouldn't see it when it was just power and authority healing. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, all right, Jesus needs to heal the sick and cast out demons, something that the church doesn't do. I mean, you'll have some in a charismatic church that are only they're pro healing and just don't want to do the deliverance. And they make it, uh, I, I mean, I, we can go into that later <laughs> at another time on the finished works concept, but uh, there's just a lot out there that don't want to deal with the demonic. And then they wonder why not everything is getting healed when they pray for it. Right. You're operating, operating in only one of the tools, the main tools and not doing everything Jesus said and modeled to do. Um, then don't expect to have 100% results. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I basically, you know, kind of try to follow Wimber's uh, model in, in the sense of, I, I don't agree with all of Wimber's theology, particularly the here and, here and not yet, but I do agree with his theology that the tools are like a toolbox, and you, when you reach your hand back, the Holy Spirit will put the right tool in your hand to be able to use, and then you have to have a multiple you know, set of tools in the toolbox. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, I definitely have to. And, um, and so as I was doing deliverance, I started noticing there was a, a cap to that, a ceiling. And, uh, then the Lord brought me into different modes of inner healing and learning that. And that's when I started to understand more of the fracturing of how the soul works. How this, I mean, when you, when it, when we get traumatized, the soul can fracture into pieces and then having to work with that. So as I developed that, I started seeing breakthrough in other areas and using that as a tool. And so I, overall, my main goal is, as cliche as it sounds, to change the world, to have an effect in bringing the kingdom on this planet. And the way I see it is to accomplish that goal. You want to train people up because you can't do it on your own. <laughs> you know, you can't change this planet on your own. Uh, you need people. You need numbers. Jesus was clear on that. Um, and so the thing is, is that as as I started just growing and going further, I was realizing, yeah, we need more people. <laughs> and And so my whole thing is to train and equip people. Grow them in the ability to heal, heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse lepers, you know, just work in their authority, do, learn, teach them how to do inner healing, teach them how to life coach, teach them how to counsel people, teach them how to do all the things that ju are just needed to get people free. And um, so I see it as I have all these tools to do whatever I need to do to get the person free so they can start walking in their calling. or Maybe there are Christians who it's not so much inner healing or, or deliverance that they need. They just need to be equipped and they need somebody to teach them because their pastor doesn't teach them. Their pastor just tells them some theology that they keep rehashing every two years or something like that of, a, of an older sermon. And they don't really equip them, which is what I believe Ephesians, I mean, Ephesians 4 is all about the purpose of what, what teaching should be to believers. Teaching is about equipping. Yeah. I mean, I'm not to not to say that we don't understand our theology, but I think that the, the equipping is understanding the nature of God, understanding who you are in Christ, and then understanding how to function like that in the in the world. So, so I think there's just a um, 
there's just a big disconnect of how church is done when it comes to how we've been doing church for so long. So um, for me, it's all about equipping. It's just teaching, equipping, and going into um, getting people into their calling, getting people out there, increasing the numbers so we have an army to fight the battle because there is a battle. And, you know, I think a lot of Christians that say that there isn't a battle are just Christians who usually are Westerners who want to stay in their comfortable world because they don't want it to they don't want to have to change their life to do anything uh, change their life uh, that uh, in the in the place that they already have because they're comfortable but if you just look at the world the world is making our life uncomfortable for the people who want to have comfort the world is getting more uncomfortable to live in yeah definitely and that's because people are not doing what they're supposed to be doing we're supposed to be transforming this planet and eventually you just sit back and do nothing and they're going to rise up and transform you and your family. And, you, and, it, and then it's too, almost too late for that. And you have to wait for the next generation to come up and figure this out. Yeah, we call it knowledge-based versus obedience-based Christianity. Yeah. yeah. Here in the West, it's, it's just you go, you go to church, you hear a sermon, you get knowledge and you do nothing with it. And so with what, what Lindsay and I do and my wife and everything is uh, something called DMM or disciple making movements. And that's basically we teach people how, OK, you learn this in Bible study. Now you're going to obey it this week and then we're going to check on you next week and see how you obeyed it. And it's 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 very, you know, and and a lot of people do that, but but a lot of them don't include the supernatural with that because they have a you know very truncated view of the supernatural. And so we believe that it's a both and. I love, I love, for example, Todd White. I, I, he's a great minister and everything, but one of my kind of like critiques of what he does is he'll do the healing, the supernatural part, but then the person is there's there's no one there to co- to come follow back through to really disciple the person. Right. I I think what he what he does sometimes he kind of looks at his testimony and he says you know I was out on drugs and then Jesus did this miraculous transformation in me and uh and and I didn't have to go through deliverance or inner healing God just transformed me but reality is is that he was discipled and Dan Muller discipled him yeah and, and he was under that tutelage for so long and <clears throat> there was and that's really what you're doing when it comes to inner healing when you're transforming things now. There's some deeper stuff that I believe everybody needs to go through. I mean, yeah. Even Todd White, <laughs> you know, yep. uh, you can see it. Um, but the thing is, is that um, I think um, you can you you can make the mistake of so many that have walked in power in the past who look at the power that they're walking in. They're seeing people get healed. They're seeing miracles happen, and then they make this assumption that they're they've arrived. Mm. and that they, they they're untouchable by the enemy because they know their authority and all this stuff and it's like mm, no you you still got you still got stuff going on and I, if you look at the past uh faith healers you, you look at the past uh super super uh sons of god you know they a lot of them ended badly you know and they had big ministries but a lot of them didn't end well their ministry and their life oh yeah um, some of them did really bad, and um, and that to me is kind of like a person who has a big sword but has very little armor on, because they make this assumption that the power flowing through them uh, translates into like super resistance of the enemy, and it's just not true. There's so much you have to clean up on the inside of your own heart. I don't care how much, how many people you heal, or how many miracles happen through you you don't realize that the enemy is going to exploit certain things that you got going on on the inside of your heart that you've just pushed off because you believe is all buried and is done. But if you have to keep pushing it off because it keeps rising up and you keep denying it and you're pushing it down and pushing it away and saying, oh, I'm a new creation. If you have to keep pushing it away, it's because it's still there. If you're tr- truly healed in that area, you don't have to push anything away Yeah. because it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. you're right. It, it, denying when it says submit to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee, that is a temporary fix. That is what we're to use on the way to getting healed. But we 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 have to do that so we can maintain our normalcy during the day, 
uh, and through our life so we don't react and make bad decisions out of our emotion. But that is a temporary fix. That's not the way it's designed to be uh, for, for our life. We're supposed to not have anything to deny because it has already been healed. This is why I don't have to deny uh, the urge to smoke crack because I've never had that in me. I've never had that insight. If you're truly healed of it completely, you, you can look at it. And if even if you're an ex addict, you look at it and there's no urge in you at all to even resist. Yeah. To fight. Yeah. And to say no. To. Yeah. That's what healed is supposed to look like. Yeah. And, and, and that comes from the, the deeper, you know, the deeper, the deeper type of healing, which, which I, I don't really like the word inner healing, even though it's still used. I, I tend to, it's basically to me, it's just mind renewal. You know, it is, it's, 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 it's right. mind. Exactly. I, yeah, go ahead. I say the exact same thing. Yeah. I, I, I cause, cause you'll have some people who look at it like that and, and they'll put inner healing in a box of it's only going about your past and digging up what had happened through your mom and dad. But inner healing, you're transforming the inside of you, which means you have to change the way you think about virtually everything. Yeah. Past, present, and future. Yeah. Yeah, it's just mind renewal. And I, I literally we used to say the same exact thing to try to try to get people to think that uh, to, 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 to put their guard down towards it and only think that it's for super broken people who are messed up, who have had horrible pasts and, you know, you know, criminal lives and all this stuff. Because that's what the connotation is. Well, if you're yeah. gonna if you're gonna go the mind renewal route, you might just as well call it repentance. I mean, that, that that's to me that's what it, the metanoia, yeah. the the change changing your mind. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it, and it's basically it's specifically targeted yeah. in areas. Yeah, you're because what people are usually doing is that they are focused on the general way of thinking, which will work to the different different degrees but what you're doing is that you're the holy spirit is taking you into specific areas that you don't realize that you're believing lies in mm. you just it, it's just under the radar you don't even know that you're doing it most of the time and you don't know that that's what's giving the the enemy um a doorway into your life and being able to hit you and so it's 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 flying under the radar, and it's God pointing that out. And you're going, "Hey, do you realize you've been believing this? I didn't even realize I was doing that. I was just so focused. I, I, or or you just you you it was never brought to your attention, uh, or you just never knew it was a problem. Yeah, because you don't know what healthy looks like, and so sometimes you have to be shown what healthy looks like, and you're like going, "Oh my gosh, my thinking has been this. Yeah, this isn't healthy. I didn't know that. You know. So sometimes it's it's informing, and sometimes it's just bringing up something you're unaware of yeah and a lot of uh cessationist types will uh, will come in and will say well you know pursue the giver and not the gifts and 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 what they're getting at is that character and fruit and all that is important and and it is we need character and fruit but we need that character and fruit to be able to really walk in the power you know so it's it's a both and situation instead of an either or yes Yes, exactly. And I mean, cessationists, I mean, when they think like that, it, it it's just their way of trying to validate their theology. I mean, they're using uh, things like that to shoot it down to just, uh, to, A, number one, it's a judgment. It's like saying that you only care about the things that God has, but you really don't care about God, That which, which is a complete judgment. It's like, you don't know that. You're, you're not into the person's heart. This is just something you say to uh, to shut that side down because you don't like it. My perspective on cessationism, it's like uh, there's no biblical version of it. I mean, there's no <laughs> – you, you don't see any biblical lifestyle of cessationism. Nope. I mean, and the one's trying to make up this idea that although the, the power of God stopped, which is completely illogical, makes no sense of why it would, and their argument usually is – well, we got the Bible now, and we and, and the apostles have already said what we they needed to say. So there's no point of of needing power to help that. It's like like don't you understand what the point of the power was? No, they don't. What was the point of the miracles? Not just to heal people, but to prove people that God was real. Yeah, prove to people that God was 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 true. 
because you can preach to people, but if you have power behind it, then that solidifies or at least helps give much more evidence to the reality of God. So that's why we want to dis display signs and wonders. And and when, especially when you work in signs and wonders, you see how effective it is to to evangelize. Oh yeah, you see yeah. how effective to to boosting Christians' faith and believing and trusting God even stronger than they ever have. This is why demons don't want it because the demonic knows the power of what happens when the supernatural comes. So I mean, cessationism is just a concoction of the demonic over Christians to make get them to believe in something completely non-biblical, something Jesus never taught, the apostles never taught that the, that the gifts would ever end. This is all their broad-based assumption based off of Western Christianity that saw very little miracles, if none, in their churches because they, they wanted to control how you, do, how you do your Christianity and be in control of the, of the church services, control of everything. And you push the Holy Spirit out. So whenever you try to pray for a miracle, nothing happens. So to justify why things are not happening when they did try to pray for a miracle, they make up a belief like that. Right. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. pretty much how something like that comes about. Cessationists sound like atheists and agnostics to me sometimes. It's the way they talk about God. Just if I'm being honest. They do. And Yeah. They do. Yeah. To be balanced, you know, sometimes <laughs> charismatics can sound a little bit like pagans or animists, but and I'll take that any day of the week over atheism or agnosticism. That, that's just me. I'd rather err on that side. Well, I've, I've kind of said the same thing because <laughs> it's like you can do more with the person who believes in a supernatural yes. God yes. than a person who doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can at least show them that the power is stronger than the power of other other religions and other belief systems that are into the power of uh, supernatural. But when it comes to agnosticism or atheism, their mind is a, such a strong block, blockage to being open to anything of, uh, of a supernatural God. So it is almost like a precursor to atheism. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the, the amazing thing to me uh, uh, about the whole concept is the book that oftentimes cessationists, which is the Bible, put all their stock in. I mean, my wife jokes that she was raised, I won't say what denomination, but she was raised basically a father, son, and holy Bible. And yeah. it, the book that we put all this emphasis in, which is is the Bible, actually displays a lifestyle of signs and wonders and miracles. And I tell this I tell this to people all the time about hearing God. It, the book that you're trying to hear God out of tells you you can hear God other ways than through this book. And people will just, you know, look at you like, what, you know, and, and I'm not taking away from the Bible. And, and I think it's a basis for our prophetic words and the basis for our faith. However, it, you know, God can speak in a myriad of many different ways and, and, and do a myriad of different things. And you're right. It was totally unknown to the apostles and prophets and, and the early church to not have a lifestyle it went until Constantine basically made it the, you know, the, the, the realm, the realm religion before signs and wonders started really basically dying out. And a, a lot of arguments over, you know, peripheral doctrines that really weren't important. The Greek lifestyle kind of seeped in and it, it moved from a Hebraic lifestyle to more of a, a, a Greek based lifestyle. Yeah. So, uh, so let me um, shift gears here. You've done a lot of work uh, with with people with a phenomenon that is called SRA or Satanic Ritual Abuse or uh, programming. I'll even go out and say maybe MK Ultra type stuff. Disassociative uh, people who are put through traumatic things to, to disassociate and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we would love just to hear about that, uh, some of your adventures and stories, but also just kind of give us a uh, a short little primer of what 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 that what that's looked like in your ministry. To, to explain what SRA is, 
uh, as I said before, the, the soul fractures so through trauma. So a person, when, when they go through trauma, their soul breaks into pieces. And um, what happens when it comes to SRA is that the demonic takes those parts and then they imprison them. Okay, so, it, it, and that's normally how it works anyways, it, when it just comes to trauma. But when it comes to SRA, it's almost like they teach your system, those parts of you, they, they recruit, it's like they recruit them for the demonic, recruit them for Satan, and get them to turn on you. Like they get them to join them, mm. the demonic. Mm. And so it's like turning your whole system on the inside against yourself. And so it makes it really hard to try to come in and get that system to come to the other side. Now, I have an analogy, and the way the analogy would work is like this. So in a typical situation of a human being, imagine like having a castle. And if you're inside of that castle, in the walls of the castle, there's protection. And that castle, being inside of that castle, would represent salvation and being in Christ. So outside of that castle, you have a village. And then you have a leader of the village, like a chief of the village. And that village, the, the chief of that village would be the core of the person, the main person that you are. And then the, 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 the people in the village under the chief would be the parts of you, the fractured parts of your soul. So it's the fractured parts of your soul. So when a when a person gets saved and comes to Jesus, it would look like the chief and some of the people in the village leave that village and then they come into that into the castle. And now they live in the castle and behind the protection of the walls of the castle. Mm -hmm. That's like normal life, normal salvation. There's some villagers that didn't want to come in to the castle but there's and there and and so they stay in that village and then when you're working with a person you want to take you want to get them healed and you want the rest of the parts of their soul to come into the castle that's like normal healing after a person's already gotten saved going through inner healing uh going through deliverance and all that that's what that is the process mm -hmm. now when it comes to uh, um also i forgot one analogy part of that analogy is that invaders came into the village and enslaved some of those people uh, that stayed behind and didn't go into the castle. So they stayed behind and then, um, uh, but the, but the chief and some of the others have gone in the castle. Now in SRA, what happens is that the invaders come in to that village, same scenario. They come into that village and they don't just, invade and imprison them they put a citadel and like a fortress around them and put them into individual compartments and then they brainwash them and transform their thinking to want to in other words they reprogram them they uh kind of like how the romans would come and do to a culture they would come in and invade the culture and then they would try to change the culture through teaching through indoctrination sort of thing. That's what's happening with SRA. They put a fortress around them to make it really hard to go in and get them and and try to and you try to rescue them and then they they indoctrinate them and brainwash them. And you have to go in there and try to convince them to uh, through their indoctrination to uh renounce it and to leave and to come into the castle. I mean, that's like a, uh, that whole metaphor is basically like the way it is with SRA. And that's why it's so difficult, because a typical person, if you just had a demon that encamp that um, imprisoned a part of your soul in the spirit realm, um, it's not that difficult to convince them to come over. I mean, sometimes you can have some parts that are parts of a person's soul that's pretty angry at God and all that. And you just got to work through that and break off some of their mindsets towards that and get them to understand how this all works but it it's easier to come over now when it comes to sra you're dealing with heavy duty indoctrination and programming of a person's parts 
and uh, or alternate personalities, as we can call them. Mm-hmm. And and so you're trying to convince them to 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 break free. But then there's what, what makes it so much more difficult is that there is a lot of witchcraft that you're that the demonic has so much more power when it comes to SRA than it does a typical situation when you're doing a deliverance inside of somebody that isn't SRA. When you're trying to cast out a demon out of a normal person that is not SRA, um, the power is just not that strong compared to SRA. I mean, in most of the deliverances I would do, I would, I would not have, um, I, I would, I would be able to use angels to hold the person down. I can do it over Skype. I can do it over video call and, or over the phone and the demon would not move and all. But when it comes to SRA, um, holding the demon down, you have to physically hold them. It's very, it's, it, the power is just much more strong and your angels have, don't have enough power a lot of times to hold some of it because the power level has been so intensified <clears throat> through years and years of accumulation of power. So a lot of times that is very challenging to many Christians to hear something like that, to think that angels can be overpowered and essentially God could be overpowered or whatever. But it's because Christians don't understand how this whole dynamic works. Right. Uh, they don't understand how that God is not in total control of everything. And that God does not work based off of his feelings. He works based off of legalities. So he doesn't save people because he loves them. He saves them because the legal right is there. He's moved from love to do it, but it's based on legal rights. This is why uh, horrible atrocities happen to Christians around the world and martyrdom and all these things. God does, um, he, he, he doesn't. Uh, these people don't die because God doesn't love them. He does love them. He doesn't want them to be killed, uh, but they die because of uh, uh, that. There's legal issues there, and a lot of times it's ignorance that keeps us from understanding how a lot of this works. And so, the more you know, the more you're able to get things done. So it's like what what I say a lot of times when it comes to doing deliverance, and you're trying to cast out demons. What takes so long? is getting the information of how the demonic has power. Mm. That's essentially what you're looking for. How does this demon have power to stay here? Because if any person that has really done deliverance and knows has actually done it and has stuck with the person and not just done a one and done thing, uh, you'll know that certain demons will not come out when you tell them to. Uh, they'll look you right in the face and smile and smirk and, and laugh in your face. If, if they know they have a legality and you'll say, no, you don't have legalities because it was destroyed at the cross and the demon will just still smile at you and laugh at you and all that, because they know that it's not an issue of convincing the demon. It's an issue of, of, of true legalities in the spiritual realm. And, um, and so the thing is, is that the demonic is going to be able to stay there if you don't understand how they have power. And 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 know how to break it, of course. It's hard to kick somebody out if you put them on the lease, basically. Is a, is a way to look at that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a lot of people just don't get that. Some people hate the concept of legalities. A demon has they've heard, you know. Well, especially in the finished works, we'll talk another time. Well, well, doesn't the Book of Job, Steve, basically? Instead of being a book that, that proves Calvinism, so to speak, the book of Job basically is a book that proves what all, all you're saying is true, that Satan and, and the Lord were in a battle over Job, and it was a spirit battle, and they Job's not even really the main character. He's just the battlefield yeah. for the, 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 the legalities between the two. I mean, is that a safe, exactly. safe assumption? Yeah. Right, exactly, and, and and it's a book of people believing that God's in total control when you can clearly see He is. Yes, and uh, they're, they're, they don't they think it's God doing all this, but they don't even know the devil's doing it. So, um, 
But I think when in that classic part in the first chapter where God says to to Satan, all he has is in your hands, people go, oh, see, there it is, the allowing scripture or the allowing theology is that God allowed Satan to uh, hurt Job. But that's not what he's saying. He's he's not allowed. He's saying that he allowed it. He's saying what he legally is capable of doing. He says, all he has is in your hands. Basically, it's based off of the legalities. In other words, this is what God has always been known as a judge. And what does a judge do? They interpret laws. They don't make laws. They say, they don't they don't even uh, they're not the executioner. They don't condemn. Their job is to tell you what the law says. It's the law that condemns the person. That's profound. It's the law yeah. that judges wow. the person. It's the law that punishes the person. So it's not the judge. So when God is basically stating to Satan, all he has is in your hands, he's just stating what the law says. That's really, that's really profound. I have never heard that. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't giving Satan permission at all because the whole concept of what was being argued was that Satan was challenging God and saying that people only love you because you bless them. People only love you because you bless them. And he goes, have you considered my servant Job? He's like, oh, yeah, you put a hedge around him. And, and, and Christians have taken that, that verse out of context so badly, and they say hedge of protection, <laughs> never said that. In the context, it's hedge of blessing. So you blessed him. You made it basically you've bribed him to love you is what Satan is saying to, to God. And he's like, take it all away. Remove the hedge of blessing around him, and he'll curse you to your face. And so... God, he was challenging God to do that, and God is like obviously not going to do that because he doesn't. He isn't the one that takes away; he gives, but he doesn't take away. Job got that wrong. Um, yes, and so, uh, so Satan was just challenging God and basically saying that, um, uh, you know, if if this guy loses everything, he won't want to serve you. He, you've only bribed him, and and so God just basically says. You can only go this far legally. You can only go this far. You can touch this and this, but you can't take his life. Mm. So that was the extent of the illegalities. And and at the same time, uh, this is before the cross, so Satan has the authority of the earth. So I don't think we're fully clear on exactly what that looked like and what that entailed, but it was something very important, the authority of the earth. That he had that the ability and the powers that was in Satan's arsenal that he took from Adam, he had up to that point. That's why he says to Jesus in Luke Luke four, he says, "Do you see all these kingdoms?" Uh, he took them on the mountain. And he says, "Do you see all these kingdoms and its glories? They were handed over to me, and I can do whatever I want with them." And uh, so, in other words. What Satan was walking with back then, uh, I mean, also contributed, I believe, to what he was capable of doing. Oh yeah, we we know the pre the pre flood world, which probably where Job was 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 in, was a nightmare. You know, with with uh, all the yeah. all the stuff that was going on. So yeah. Anyway, so let I want to steer us back to the um, the SRA. I kind of took a rabbit trail with this there. Um, the, a question I have is that we, we all in, encounter DID and you, you said that in, in SRA is more, uh, difficult to deal with, but what brings about the, the whole, I mean, it's called satanic ritual abuse. So that's where it comes from. Can you kind of explain to us what that means? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so what I was explaining was what goes on in the spiritual world. What happens in the natural is that the person usually at a young age, very young, around five, will be subjected to uh, excruciating, excruciatingly painful and difficult rituals. And the whole goal of being put in a ritual by somebody, could be a family member or somebody outside of the family, is to fracture the person and demonize the person. So it's almost like they are 
when they put them under an intense ritual, it's like they will cut them, they will, um, they will sexually rape them. I mean, they will, they will do so many heinous, heinous things to the to the child. And when a child is at that age of five, that is usually the prime age where you fracture the most, where your brain is developed the most, but where you can't handle difficult intensity. And so the option for the child is to only disassociate. Yeah. And as they subject them to these difficult rituals of pain, putting, you know, excru excruciating pain on them and, and frighten them and on so many different levels, there are soul fractures. And then through that, the demonic in the spiritual world takes those parts of their soul and then organizes them, names them, and programs them and has more of their th this child's mind under control and so it happens they, they 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 do it more and more uh it's it's not usually just one ritual it's several rituals over time that they will do it many of them it could be in the natural um and then sometimes there will be rituals done in the spiritual world mm. on the child mm. um but the whole purpose is to fracture them and to make a type of um, future disciple, in a sense. See, when a person gets fractured like that and it's repetitive, the child won't remember any of it mm -hmm. because they disassociate. Now, if a child goes through one traumatic situation through their childhood, like if they get molested one time, They'll remember every detail of that molestation. But if it's happened repeatedly again and again, over and over, over a period of time at this young age, they won't remember any of it mm. until they get older in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. Would you say they're kind of almost taking advantage of kind of our bodies and minds sort of coping mechanisms? Like, naturally, if that happens yes. over and over again, your body might repress that because. Of the damage yes. it can do. Yeah. Yeah. So so the demonic knows how all this works and they just they just guide their their disciples and their followers on what to do in the natural. But the demonic knows exactly what's going on and, and how to really bind up and bound the person into bondage uh through this. And so the ultimate purpose of this is Twofold. I mean, it's in one sense, it's to get power from the person. So the best way I could describe it is that SRA, people who are SRA are like power sources for witchcraft and the demonic mm -hmm. in the spiritual world. It's like they can utilize them as a power plant and pull power from their system in the spirit world. So it's not like they're just torturing them just for fun. There's a method to this madness. Mm -hmm. They are literally trying to fracture the person so completely that they will have such deep allegiance to the demonic on the inside that they can just utilize the person's system for power. Like a, a principality over an area can utilize an SRA person's system for power mm. to get things done in the natural, mm. to create... to to heighten the level of crime in an area or or domestic abuse or uh or, or or demonic protection over satanic you know covens or whatever there there's just so much what can be done from it it's just a power source the demonic is all about gaining power and witchcraft if you're a witch and now let me just say this not all witches are into this i would say it's a small percentage most witches are dabblers white witches they call yeah them. but yeah it's still demonic but but the, the reality is is that they are they will never go this far where you're you're taking advantage of human beings like this because it's a legal activity it's like getting into criminal activity right um and, and so you are uh if you're going this this far deep down the rabbit hole you are uh really lustful after power 
that's why you're doing it. You are deep in with the demonic if you're going to go to this level where you're going to be willing to kill people and willing to torture people so you can get more power. That's what it's all about. You know, Steve, it sounds very vampiric. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like the, the vampires get their power from the more people that they get the blood from, so to speak. It, it sounds like it's a very vampiric type operation. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It's it's just like that. I mean, the the, the demonic is all about gaining power because they want to be able to control the earth. Mm. They want they don't want the kingdom of God to rule the earth and to kick them out and put them in prison. <clears throat> they want power to resist that and to set up what they truly believe could be their own kingdom. I I, I know a lot of Christians think that demons know that the end is near and that they are going to lose and all that. That's just not what no. the reality is. No. They don't believe that they will lose. They, I mean, they truly believe a, because they're not a human being and they don't, not thinking from your perspective, but they, they truly believe that they're going to win. And the reason why is because they've been winning. <laughs> so why in the world would they just think that they're going to lose when they see how they have destroyed Christians and ministries for years, yeah. for centuries, yeah. they've destroyed the church. They've kept it down. They've they got the church to quarrel with themselves and fight and be ineffective. And then the church thinks that they're winning because somebody gets healed on the side and they go, oh, we're change, transforming the planet. You know, but if you look at the state of the planet, you look at how things are going. You think they're they're shaking in their boots. No, they really, truly Satanists, true Satanists, Luciferians yeah. and, and demons truly believe they're going to win because they don't see that Jesus is stronger because it doesn't look like it. It just doesn't look like it in the macro, on the macro level. Yeah. And so, and so Christians are deluded when they say, they say that they think demons are shaking in their boots, thinking that they're going to lose and that their, their time is near and that God is going to judge them. The demonic knows how this works. They know it works on legalities. They know that God will not break his own laws and just step in and just say, hey, I'm going to break my law because you guys are just getting too far and destroying this whole planet. No, they know that God is integrous and that he doesn't break his own laws. So they are using, they, they know that they're protected by those legalities. And they're protected by the legalities because the church is ignorant. Because the church is the one that is given the authority by Jesus to go out and regulate the law on the demonic. And we just sit back and we we tell ourselves we're winning. The enemy has been defeated because he was defeated at the cross. <laughs> you know, and 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 we use that as our rallying cry rather than the true victories in the natural the, the point of the cross was to say hey you got the power to go out and, right. and regulate right, right. and put these demons in prison yeah. but you know you can't just sit there on your bed and go oh <laughs> the cross happened you know and the blood of jesus is shed and it and it wipes away all certificates of death it's like no you're still dying <laughs> you're still dying of old age your your body still de is is still um you know uh you're getting older and you're getting sickness and disease and one day you're going to die and that wasn't the intention of what god wanted but we sit back and we think that we've arrived and so the church just keeps living in a cognitive dissonance thinking that they're further along than they really are and and that type of thinking it constitutes laziness and people sitting around thinking that they don't need to do anything. It's like, no, we all need to do something. If we're going to see this world transform and your kids not be taken out with it, you know, in your family, people just sometimes think about themselves and they don't think about the loved ones around them that are not strong, a strong believer like they are. It's like, don't you care about your kids? Don't you care about your parents? Don't you care about your friends? You know, get off your butt and fight for them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell people oftentimes, in my opinion, that Satan, the Satan, whoever he is, Lucifer or whatever, the whole Luciferian worldview is not like our Christian worldview. They're not really worshiping the devil or the the, the deceiver or the adversary. They they believe a ancient Babylonian worldview which basically puts Yahweh as the as the evil one and their God as the the hero, you know? So, right. and the other thing too is, is people need to realize that if Satan is the father of all lies, 
then there's a very real possibility that he's a pathological liar. Well, the, one of the, the, the things about pathological liars is they believe their lies. Yeah. And, and so he yes. thinks he's going to win the battle. Yes. You know, he, well, like I said, if you have the fruit of victories in front of you, it's just going to only solidify your belief that you're going to win even more. Yes. If you just see Christians crumble because you put some stress into their life, you're just going, we got this in the bag. Look at look at how many we just killed. Look at how many just accepted death. Look at how many that don't want to fight and just want to sit back and do their American dream lifestyle. We got this in the bag. We can keep controlling it. We can do whatever. You know, it, it's like they're, they're, they're going to be convinced that they're going to win because the, ch the church hasn't realized a God's not in total control. They and they then lose. number two, that you, yeah, you, yeah, you gotta, you've got to realize that as a believer, you got to now grow. You can't just get caught up in the American dream lifestyle, and and it doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to have a family, kids, and a house. You just can't make that the priority over your calling. Yes, which is what too many do. Yeah, well, people don't realize the responsibility that we have. We have responsibility, a commission to 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 do the things that we need to do. Yeah, the earth is going to get worse. Yeah, the, there's going to be an ultimately a battle and all that stuff. But we have to be like the wise virgins and become prepared for for what's coming. And we can't do that just using our Christianity to supply us with that. That's one of my pet peeves with with a lot of the super hyper prosperity doctrine. Does God bless us? Absolutely. You know, He blesses us to do kingdom things. But a lot of the you know, it's it's not about us. It's about a kingdom, and 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 we've got to realize that. And and one of the ways that that we realize that is 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 going deeper, you know, into what what he's called us to do. We're soldiers. Yeah, yeah. See, the prosperity gospel where they get it wrong is that they're saying you get all this stuff by sitting on your butt being an American. Christian. Exactly. That's that. That's not true. It's just like that. That's not what Jesus taught. Blatantly, not what he taught, and what not what he modeled. He Jesus lived a full on lifestyle, being one with the Father, and just going after the Father and going after his business, knowing the heart of the Father and what the Father wants. You do that, all that stuff's going to just come upon you, and then people are going to get jealous and think that God loves you more than than them. It's like, no, I'm just doing what He told me to do, and this stuff follows you. Yeah. Yep. But it's not. It doesn't just follow you because you committed your life to Jesus. And you give them your Sundays and you pray before you eat dinner. You know, uh, yeah. it, it's like, it, it's like there, there's such a, a disconnect from the reality. If, if you do half of the things Jesus said you do, you see half of the things Jesus said you'd see. <laughs> now that's worth the price of a mission there. I love that quote. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm writing that one down. You, <laughs> if you, if you, if you see everything going on in the world, I mean, I, I just don't understand how you could just sit back and just do nothing. Yeah. And just see how it, this is not the will of God the way it's supposed to work. But we just sit back and we we just say it's okay. Or we just tell ourselves it's not that bad. Or you're like a, like a lot of other Christians where they, they just don't want to hear about the bad news. No, I don't want to hear about the bad news. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's good to hear about the bad news because it provokes you to start doing something to get off your butt. But if you just want to sit back and not hear a, a, of everything that's going on, I, the only time I see it's it's not feasible to listen to the bad news is if you're already getting going out there doing what you need to do, then you don't need to be encumbered with more stuff to stress you out or whatever or to to pull your peace away. Uh, if you're just doing kingdom business, but if you are just doing nothing, you need to know what's going on and you need to understand that you can't wait for your politicians to go and change your world for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Know, you can't just sit there and just. Uh, oh, I, I hope the the person we put in is gonna is gonna make our country better. It's like, come on, guys. Huge distraction. Uh, huge I, distraction. It is a huge. I, I'm not saying don't vote. We should vote. Yeah. But when you're putting all your marbles into one thing at, for an agent of change, you're missing the whole point of how this works. You're supposed to do everything available to you, which means, you know, if 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 God has called you to be a school teacher. Well, then you live for Christ at your job. I'm not saying that you have a megaphone and tell all the kids 
every day that Jesus Christ is Lord or something like that. But I'm saying there's ways of when you go to school, you're not there to earn a paycheck. You're there to minister to people in under the radar in a way where you can influence the culture within that within that uh, school that you're at. Yep. You know, if Christians had that mindset wherever they went to their job and realize that that is what kingdom business looks like, it doesn't mean everybody has to become a missionary or a pastor or something like that or a deliverance person. It's just going out and being intentional about ministering the kingdom to everybody around you at your job or your family or whatever it is. Every day you're trying to improve the lives and trying to bring the love of God into their life so they can see him and become more apparent to them. I mean, that's how our show, uh, that's what kingdom thinking is. Yes. Interested in being on our podcast? Contact us through our website, unrefinedpodcast.com. All right, so back to the the SRA. Can you, without obviously, I don't want the details, the 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 you know the personal stuff you can't talk about. But can you kind of go into this journey that you've been having over the past few years with this? Uh, I mean, I've just caught you know glimpses from your Facebook post about Coven's chasing you and all kinds of. It just sounds like a sounds like a a, a good Netflix show is what it sounds like to me. So can you go can yeah. you go into some of uh, the details of that stuff, some of your journeys and some of the supernatural things yeah. you've seen. So in 2016, the person I've been working with in Canada, um, as we started to do more deliverance work, more stuff started coming up in the person. And as time went on, as you start to unlock all the stuff that is inside of that person, it, it kind of like creates a Pandora's box effect where everything just goes crazy once that happens Hmm. once you open it up and you expose that the sra is there it's like it's 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 like complete hell yeah like you've opened up a box of to hell and it's hard for the person it's hard for this family the situation everything going on it's it's very difficult and so once that happened it, it almost like sends i would say it like sends a a an alarm in the spirit realm to local covens that are connected with this person that their system is compromised in a sense. And when that happened, and I'm not saying this is like this for every SRA person, not all SRA people are the same and not all SRA people are at the same level. There's different levels. I would say this person is a very high level. And when that happened, they there were covens that were trying to basically kidnap them hmm. and and kill the per, this person and so uh that's when i knew we had to bring that person into safety and there's a lot of events that would happen in this time and during that time we had to basically go on the run for an entire year because of it. And every time we would, we would, we would leave, we knew we had to go because the the location of where we were at was found out basically. So we would go to different places in the country. uh, People that I, I basically put an SOS out on my Facebook and I got a lot of emails from people who offered play offered a room for um, a place for us to stay. And in that time um, we were able to, uh, uh, to do deliverance, do what we needed to do. Cause the thing is I knew in that time that the more deliverance we did, the more we broke off, the more they weren't able to find us. Mm. But in that time, what it was difficult uh, because as you know, when it, you're dealing with 
multiple personalities in a person. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with the fracturing of their soul. And so a lot of times they would have parts of their soul that would come up, fractures or alternate personalities that were what we would call either cult loyal or loyal to the coven or witch alters, alternate personalities. Mm -hmm. And they would resist me. Like they would, when they would come up in the person's body, they would fight me like physically. I can't tell you how many fights I had to literally restrain this person because they would come after me and punch, bite, kick, everything you can ever imagine. It was almost like that every day for months mm. in the very beginning. Like I had to constantly do that. And I remember the first time I had to work with them in the physical, like in person, um, I looked like I was in a car accident. I took a couple pictures, <laughs> wow. you know, and you could tell my face and my arms and I had just scratches all over me and bruises and my hands hurt and all this stuff because I had to restrain the person. And luckily I know jujitsu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I know how to do holds and all that. So I, I, I'm, it, it's like second nature to me, but it, it, that came really in handy, you know, to do a lot of this. Um, because it was always that crazy. I'd have, I would have to restrain the person a lot because they would literally run away, try to run out the door and take off. And I'd have to like grab them, pick them up, pull, take them back and, uh, and then hold them down until they switched out until their core came back up or what I would say parts loyal or uh, fractures that were loyal to me or Christian or saved parts we call them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then they would, you know, like, Oh, thank you. You know, they would be grateful that I didn't let them run out the door <laughs> into the city or whatever, you know? Um, because yeah, it was, it, it, it's just such a, it was such a crazy, crazy, surreal experience. There was so much that happened. I've, I've, I've documented so much of it. Um, especially all the deliverances and the crazy types of deliverances, things that would happen. A lot of paranormal stuff would happen all the time um and uh and then this was also the time where i m my girlfriend at the time who i'm good friends with now i mean we're not dating anymore but we were dating at the time the covens were actually coming after her mm. and she lived in san diego and when we were doing this we were driving around the country she was in San Diego, and the first thing that happened to her was that she had a letter on her car, and it says, if your effing boyfriend doesn't quit what he's doing, then you'll be the one to pay next. Wow. And so, so she so gets this little, like a piece of paper on her car, and then she has, uh, she goes to her place, her, her apartment, and then she sees two people standing out front. She feels like the Lord's telling her to go to the back and try to enter in from the rear. Yikes. And so she starts coming in. And then those people see her and they start running after her. And then she runs inside, gets in her in her apartment, closes the door, locks the door. And then those people run to her door, try to grab, they grab the door handle and try to rattle it and they'll try to open it. Wow. They try to get her. Man. Um, and there was just so many other things that had happened to her. Um, she had eventually moved and lived with some friends of mine. Uh you know, and then we didn't want to talk about where she lived, you know, at the time. So it was just, um, it was a crazy intense time. And, uh, it was, it was just so crazy on so many levels. It was, I, for me, it was challenging me because I just didn't think the demonic can do some of this stuff. Wow. You know, cause I, I think when you're in safe Christianity, you just, you see, Christians beating up witches. <laughs> I'm not saying physically or anything, but like yeah. taking their authority over them. You know, you hear the stories of a witch coming into church and then the crawling out of the church because the presence of God, you know, they, they can't stand it and all that stuff. And so you hear victories like that. But the reason why this is different <clears throat> is because like if a witch comes into a church that's where the power of God's really strong, well, then they're they're it's like they're uh, they're the away team and they're coming on home field advantage to the other team, you know. So there's uh, they're risking a lot when they do something like that. Right. Um, but 
what I'm doing is I'm going into their territory trying to get somebody else free and getting somebody else free that their system is fully compromised mm. and given their heart over to Satan, at least not their whole system, but part of it, you're, you're dealing with something that where you're at a, a great disadvantage. See, I, I wasn't so much concerned for my life ever. Like I wasn't afraid like they were going to do anything to me. But I was more worried for her, the person. And as I was working with this person, she was, uh, you know, it, there was just so much that that I knew that if they ever got a hold of her, I don't know if I'd ever see her again. Mm -hmm. And she has a family too, you know. So it was such a difficult situation all the way around. And um, but at, at what was also different too is that this person was like family to me. And I remember when I first started one of her, her teenage alters asked me to be her dad. And they always like wanted a dad figure in their life. Mm. And I remember the Lord talking to me a lot about that, about being a father and what that would look like. And so I felt like the Lord had been preparing me for a few years to kind of fill that role in a sense yeah. of being like a spiritual dad to her. Yeah. And so, and and then after that, I told that like her core accepted that. And then I became like her spiritual father. So it was like me being a, uh, like a, like a dad, a protector in that sense to this person. So it was, I realized over time that half of the battle is, deliverance and breaking off demonic legalities and then the other half is life coaching and reparenting the person mm. into health yeah and i th and, and i think that's one of the biggest changes that i've learned from all of this in in, in the revelations is because it i felt like god had been kind of showing me that over time before it but it really was emphasized through this whole experience of something that I believe is extremely critical to traumatize people, especially SRA. Like, it's it's not enough to just cast out their demons. You have to reparent them. Because the demonic has done so much trauma to their thinking and and has eliminated so many avenues for them to grow normally you have to build them up back into health. And you can't think that just because you cast out demons and you say, hey, here's Jesus, go to Jesus, that it's automatically just going to happen to the person. If that's the case, then you don't need to parent your own children because they'll just, Jesus will do it as they get older. You know, it just doesn't work like that. Right. Because well, it's not in total control. It just doesn't do mind tricks like that or mind, you know, spells to a person where you just instantly know everything. And so um, with... With that, it, it, it's really what you're doing is you're discipling the person at a deep level. Yes. The demonic has done so much trauma to their thinking that you have to, you have to um, rebuild them up from the floor up. So, like, if they were traumatized at such a young age, that means that in, in most situations of SRA, their parent system isn't good. It typically is not the best if they're SRA. Their par the parenting is not always the best. And I'm not saying that's like across the board, but most of the time the demonic will have power to be able to control their surroundings, which even means their parenting around them to make sure that they don't get the healthy parenting that is vital for healthy building blocks as you get older. Well, let me ask you a question here about that, yes. about that real quick. Uh, uh -huh. Is it usually the parents are involved in the SRA, or is it just it just depends on the situation? Sometimes that's the case, and sometimes it's not. Okay. Uh, in this person's case, it was her uncle that was involved, and he lived with them when she was five mm -hmm. in the basement, and he was into Satanism. So, Steve, you've kind of answered this to some degree, and you just but uh. I was just kind of wondering what what are some of the the common denominators, the kind of the profile of 
of someone who who's a victim of of SRA. Like what it looks like for them. Yeah. Well, it, it would like in this person's case, they were Christian. You know, they went to church. They were actually leaders in the church. But when you look back, she had a lot of issues with uh, Father God, with Jesus. I mean, she would worship Jesus and all this stuff. But um, it, on the inside, it just didn't always settle with her. Now, they, they had, had a lot of emotional issues. I mean, it looked like a person who was really, really broken. A person who was uh, ha has a lot of anger. A person who maybe was a loner or they just, everything goes wrong in their life. Like, those are the outside things that you would be able to see. Um, like, when this person came to me for for help, they weren't coming to me for help for their SRA because they didn't even know they were SRA. They came to me because they had issues with IBS and anxiety, hypochondria. Wow. And, it, and, and so they came to me because of health issues. As I started working with them, stuff more stuff started coming up. I, I realized they were DID within within weeks, within a week, I think. Um, and so I'm going, huh, okay, there may be some sexual trauma there. You know, um, when you have DID and it comes up that easy, usually sexual abuse is the culprit. Um, if a person's gone through sexual abuse as, as a child, I mean, they're going to most likely go into that DID camp. Now, I believe everybody fractures from trauma. Right. But I don't believe everybody is at the level of being DID though. Um and so uh with with this person they just had so many issues in their past and um that it, I mean they would try their best to 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 worship Jesus, to worship God and it, everything would just be shut down all the time most of the time. Could hardly feel the presence of God. I mean or, or not at all. Nothing. Um, but what had happened when I first worked with this person, uh, I was working with them for six months. I could not get things to really change. I remember trying to get them to do declarations over themselves. Like God, I'm, I'm amazing. God loves me. Uh, I'm lovable. You know, I'm beautiful. All of that stuff. And normally when you, I work with people in the past, we do that one time. And it's good after that. It's easy for them to say. Every time we would do it week after week, it would never improve. It would always be extremely difficult, extremely hard to say. And I'm going, geez, what's going on here? You know, could not figure out why nothing was really working. And then I, uh, I, I suggested to her to journal one day. And then she started to journal. The next session we came back. Uh, we had finished the session and then I remembered about telling her about journaling and she's like, oh yeah, I journaled. I'm like, oh cool. Well, what did you write? And she said, she goes, oh, weird stuff. Like I, my hand took over and I started writing in different handwriting and then and I'm like, uh-huh. And, and then I go, well, what did you write? She says, uh, st weird stuff like Satan is my father. I'm a little witch. I'm a little witch. And then I said, well, you probably should have told me that at the beginning of the <laughs> session. Now we're at the end of it. Uh, and, and so her, her, her way of telling me that and not telling me that <laughs> was like, how did you not see that this was super important for you to tell me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so once, once we started diving deeper into it, uh, a month later, she had, triggered from something she'd saw and and then she saw it and what it was was uh, a pentagram she saw a pentagram and then when it, when when she saw the pentagram she literally freaked out dropped to her knees went under the crawled under the table and was shaking and scared so i'm like going oh so we're probably dealing with sra here wow and i i wasn't trying to assume that you know i wanted to you know make sure that we had all the evidence I don't want to just call everybody SRA, but yeah, uh, yeah. So that I mean, it was things like that that would start, and then once we started opening up more and more of the person system, 
uh, it just got crazier and crazier. And um, I mean, when we were, were on the road, uh, the re the way we would leave, know to leave is that an angel would show up. Mm. And he would have a hat on or a, something on his head that say urgent. See him in the spirit. I, in the spirit, and then he basically, when he'd show up, it was you had about maybe a day to leave and go to the next place. Wow! And I mean, the, w driving on the road was hard at times. Sometimes she would get into a program, and a program is it's like mind control. It's like I all of a sudden. Like if a person has a remote control, you hit the button, all of a sudden the person is all, it's almost like they turn into a robot and they've got to do something because they just have to do it. Like, uh, like the movie, the Philadelphia experiment when they, when they MK ultra, uh, Denzel, what was it? Didn't know. Manchurian. Was, Manchurian. Oh, man, man, Manchurian. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's what MK ultra programming is like. And I didn't believe it was real until I saw it firsthand. I was like, is this real? But hypnotism is is basically where it happens from so people people who get hypnotized are are most likely people who have programming in them that can be hypnotized you know you ever see it on a talk show of people getting hypnotized mm -hmm. it's tapping into that that ability for the person the, the fracture of the person to come up and so uh, but yeah, I did. I didn't think it was real until I saw it. But I remember there were times we'd be driving, and she would be unbuckling her seatbelt and then opening up the side door as I'm driving and try, and wanting to jump out. I have to grab her by the neck in a headlock, and then pull the car over and then restrain her and then switch her out because a part would come up to kill kill themselves for suicide. Mm. A lot of there actually a lot of times she tried to commit suicide on the when we were on the road. And I had to stop her. It's like a kill switch they programmed inside of her, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple times she's tried to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got stabbed in the neck one time. I would have to hide, hide all knives and uh, sharp objects and everything like that because there are alters that would become, that would come up to try to kill me. So, I mean, there, it was, there's some weird, interesting things that would happen, but, um, I mean, it was it was just a crazy, crazy journey. Um, well, let me ask you this: what, what, yeah. what, what, what is the most paranormal or supernatural miracle or weird thing that that you saw on this whole journey? Well, there, there's been a lot of them, but there, this is one I think it was kind of more funny. Like when I do deliverance, I. I don't get all intense yeah. and yeah. and scared about it. Yeah. I get I, I I do I I like to make a lot of jokes and have more of a casual attitude towards it. I don't care how crazy it gets to. Um but I work with another SRA person. Now, to make this more complicated, these the two SRA people were tied together. So the one in Canada that I work with and the one in Washington are tied spiritually together. And so I started working with the one in Washington when I was on the road, halfway on the journey on the road with the person. And I would have to only work with them over Skype. But one day we came back to see, I, I didn't know that this person was SRA though. I mean, there's so much backstory, but I, 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 I don't want to go into all the detail because it'd take too long to, for me to bring it up. But in a nutshell, I, I we went to her house when we were on the road, this other person, and I didn't I I knew that there was something going on with her, and she knew, which is why I went there to pray, and I I remember praying over her, and um, and then I said, you know what? Why don't you just repeat after me? Just do this. Say, uh, I renounce my marriage to Satan, and then all of a sudden she just lunges at me, lunges at me. Like, wow. like trying to grab my the demon, the demon in her just like lunges at me. I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> we got one here too, you know, but so now I'm dealing with two SRA people in the same house. Um, one time I, I remember I have in, in the one from Canada, 
her one of the saved altars is up in her body and i called her faith i called her faith and and i said faith here i'm going to do some deliverance on this on the one from washington i'm going to do some deliverance and you can help while i do it like you know or watch you know and as i was doing it the demon in the one on the bed she's on her bed and the the demon's coming up in her and then as I'm trying to deal with the demon on the bed, the, the one from Canada, her her demon, or a witch altar, I think. Is it a, no, no. Yeah, a witch altar in her comes up in her body. And so I have to hold her down. <laughs> I'm holding her down while I'm trying to do deliverance of the one of the demon that's on the bed. And then they're conversing between each other. <laughs> And and they're trying to like work against me, and so I'm trying to put the, my hand over the mouth of the of the demon or the witch altar so she can talk to that the demon. And they're going back and forth, and so um, the the uh, and then I think the demon finally tells me what I want it to hear, and then the witch altar that I'm I'm sitting on is is cursing at the demon pissed off because I the demon gave me some information that I wanted. And so they're arguing back and forth now because they're so angry. She's angry because she's like, you turn coat, something like that. Um, there were times where I would be doing that and and then witch altars, they would be working with each other and they'd be flashing signs while I'd be holding one down, the other one would be behind me, and there would be flashing signs to the other one, some weird, you know, pagan signs, to try to do something. And so I would, I'd be having to like try to to hold them back at the same. I'm like doing deliverances from from this end, from that end. It would be like that uh, over and over because mainly I could not keep the other one. That it like I couldn't keep the other one by themselves. Like I had to keep them at, I had to know where they were at all times. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like you were playing spiritual twister. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was exactly like that. That's the best way I can describe it. It was exactly like that. It was crazy. Um, I remember there was this one spot on the lawn. Like, see, there were witches that would come to the person's house in Washington. They would come to their house and they would leave objects on her on their property. And then there was this one spot we went out there and the one from Canada went with me. And then I go to that, that spot and then all of a sudden she just faints and falls flat on the ground. Boom. And then I, I'm like, uh oh, because the power from that, whatever that object was hit her. I pick her up and she's like speaking in some weird demonic tongue. Like, well, I should have it like that. Yeah. Like, and I'm like picking her up. And then the other one is in the house doing some sort of weird ritual. I'm grabbing her. I'm having to stabilize her, break off the demonic thing that attached itself to her. And then I had to go deal with the other one. It was, that was just as, as crazy as could be. I mean, there are some of the many other details that had happened that I'd written down. But um, we would have... Um, we would have like a, a, a ghost. There, there was a, a, a an alien human spirit that was attached to the one in Canada. Uh, it was it was through her family line, and um, her family line was um, they al allowed this woman who was some sort of psychic to come into their bloodline, and so she traveled into their bloodline, and this 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 person would come and sometimes manifest through her body. Mm. And so um, when it would manifest through her body, it would, uh, I mean, it would taunt me and do all this stuff. Eventually, I think when we were around in Baltimore towards the end, um, we, we, we cut this person off from her and we know, and, and see when this person would show up, it would, it would move physical objects. It would open doors. 
it would uh it would it was able to, usually if if physical objects are moved uh they're from ghosts they're not from demons usually yeah. Um, yeah. they're empowered by the demons of course but um they're usually from specific ghosts now a ghost is is usually a it's a part of a person's soul that is like a fracture that is locked in a dimension stuck and uh, and that's why there are like in certain places where you will see ghosts uh, in certain spots. It's it's not always a demon. Sometimes it's a demon posing as a, per a dead person. Right. But it's usually a part that is stuck in a dimension in a, in a location because a trauma was done there. And so the goal of what you did, what you're to do is to preach the gospel and uh, and, and get them to go to Jesus is what. I don't know if you're, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I don't know if you're familiar with it. There was a, actually an Anglican priest at the turn of the century that dealt a lot with um, these alien human spirits. And and one of his primary methods in, in, in sanding our, our, our ministry, we've used this, is he gave them communion and that severed the alien human spirit from the person. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Yeah. You've heard of that? Well, uh no, I haven't heard of that. I mean, I basically the the job is basic. It's like the same thing that you're doing with a with a part inside of a person. Yeah, you're just wanting to get them out of that bondage because the demon is holding them up in that location. And there's a demon close by that is imprisoning them and keeping them. Sometimes they don't even know that there's a demon there, or they they may know that there's some dark entities around them, but they don't know. They can't see it sometimes. Uh, and, but they're being locked in a in a in a in a loop, sort of thing. Mm. Um, and so, I've dealt with that a couple times. Uh, some other crazy experiences where I remember one time a person messaged me, and they said, "Steve, whenever I drive by this certain spot in the city, I get really fearful and afraid. I don't know why. I drive by it and I get super afraid and, and petrified." And I said, "Huh, all right. Well, let's let's check it out. Let's let's see what's going on." So I started working with her and I said, "All right, the one who's afraid on the inside of that certain location, I want you to come up right now." And all of a sudden, she a part in her comes up. And this and and, and she starts freaking out. She's like, no, "I don't want to go back there. I'm afraid." And da, 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 da. you know, and she's super scared. Now, this lady that I'm talking to in the natural, she's a, a black woman, but the person that was coming up in her was a white woman. Wow. And, wow. and so I, I, so when this, this girl comes that this part that comes up inside of her, she's afraid, she's scared. She's like going, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to go back there. And I'm like, what, what I go, hold on, let me talk to so-and-so. And I said, so and so, come up, because I wanted the core of the person to come back up, because I wanted to talk with her. And then all of a sudden, a demon barges in the way and says, "No, she can't talk right now." And I and I said, "Get out of the way, you know, move the demon out of the way." And then I finally got the core of the person up, and I said, "So what's going on? What do, what are you seeing?" And she says, "I see this woman. She's white. She is. She she's on that street corner." She's looking around the street corner and she sees a guy in a hood, like a hoodie. And he's standing behind a barrel with like fire, like, like, like on a street corner sort of thing, like for warmth. And, and she's afraid of this person really bad. I, I don't know why. So I'm like, huh, okay. I said, all right, let me, let me, let me, let me go back and talk to this, this girl then. She's like, okay. So I said, the one who was afraid, come back up. She come comes up and she's scared and, and all this and i and and i said why are you afraid of him she said he's gonna kill me he's gonna kill me and i said huh okay and i and i said um i i asked her i go by let me let me ask you what's your name and she told me what her name was and it was some off name, some different name and then i said what year is it and she goes it's 1978 said okay huh all right and then i said okay so 
do you know who Jesus is? And she's like, yeah. I said, I go, Jesus wants to help you right now. Would it be okay if we asked Jesus to help you right now? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I said, okay, just repeat after me. Jesus, will you come and remove that guy that is going to hurt me? Remove him and get him out. And then she repeats that. And then all of a sudden I hear her go, yeah, Jesus, get him, Jesus, go, Jesus, go, get him, Jesus. And then, and then she's really relieved. And then I said, um, what, what did you see? And she says, Jesus just came and he grabbed him and he took him and he took him away and something like that. And I'm like, great, that's awesome. I said, well, you know, Jesus really loves you. And, and I said, would you like to go with Jesus? And she's, she's like, yeah. And so I said, told Jesus to come and she saw Jesus and she just, uh, she went with Jesus. Wow. And so it was gone. Now, um, what had happened was like I, she, I, the core of the person, I started talking with them and she saw all this going on and she's like, yeah, that was so weird. What do you think that is? And I said, this is what I believe. I, 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 it seemed like this girl may have been a prostitute. And this girl would have been a victim of that guy. And that he probably did kill her. That part was still stuck, though. And, 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 and I, the rest of her soul, I don't know exactly what had happened. But that part was stuck. And, and so we just basically released her from that place and see the demonic when when a murder happens a lot of times the demonic can establish like a base right there in a sense they uh it's like they 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 hold that territory because blood was shed on the ground mm, yeah and so so like when a car accident happens you know blood can be established right there so the demonic can take residents and then they can create they they can have more control over that environment or that neighborhood where they can make more things go wrong in that place yeah um so that's why like praying over certain areas and releasing what has been done on that can help shift the environment and the natural you know decrease the crime or decrease car accidents or things like that in an area because certain things have been done in that place Sometimes a curse had been put there or whatever. But so so this had happened. And and then later she drove by that corner and and she felt nothing. Like the like that fear and that 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 paranoia, that's that fear was completely gone after that. Now, what's interesting is that I started to look in, in the history of that that area at that time. And this is in Tallahassee, Florida. And at that time, it was a, she either told me 78 or 79. I don't remember exactly what the date was. But in that time, this was the, the spot in the – not I wouldn't – it was the same city in the town where yeah, Ted Bundy that's what I was thinking, got Ted Bundy. This, yeah. It was the, the – and see, Ted Bundy was living in some sort of abandoned crack house at that time. And see, he got caught because he tried to go into a sorority there and try to grab one of the women. And that's what got him caught. But typically what happens is that if there are prostitutes that wind up dead, they never report those. They just, because it happens so frequently. Like that that's what would happen with um, the Green River Killer in Washington. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, Gary Ridgway, he killed like 40 women. Uh, and it wasn't making a lot of news until was, the numbers were just getting really high because uh, because there were prostitutes. Um, but and and so it's interesting that it happened all around the same time. So yeah, crazy story. Well, cool. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. And this was awesome. I mean, I think this is uh, this is one of the best ones we've done. I just appreciate your time. We went way longer than than we had allotted for you, but I, I just enjoy uh, hearing all your insight and and maybe down the road I'd like to have you on again because there's some other things I'd like to a- ask you questions about, I- including aliens. So we won't go there this time, <laughs> but I'd, I'd love to hear about your thoughts about alien abductions and stuff like that. So, but uh, thank you so much, Steve.
Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.